may be seated. And if we have any kids that want to head over towards Children's Church, Brittany's going to be leading the group over there this morning. For everyone else, if you have a Bible on you or something you read your Bible on, we're going to start this morning in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Now... If you're using the YouVersion Bible app, you know you can scan this code and it will open up those apps right there on your phone to where you can follow along with all those notes. If you have a Bible like this in your hands and you want to find the book of Ecclesiastes, if you open it to around the middle and you find Psalms and Proverbs, keep going just a little bit. If you get to Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, whatever your Bible says, jump back quickly the other way, very quickly the other way, and and you will find the book of Ecclesiastes. But I'm going to read... Um, I know you've got all of that back there, but I'm just going to read the first three verses and then I'm going to jump down to verse 12. So if you will, let's just follow along and let's read the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? And then jump down to verse 12 with me. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow and the more knowledge the more grief. So just sit that aside. We will jump very quickly back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, but let's get our minds in the right headspace this morning for where we are going with this message. Uh, In 2009, the British Humanist Society, I know there's probably lots of members in here this morning, but the British Humanist Society in 2009, they launched a campaign that they said was designed to, in their words, brighten the face of atheism across the United Kingdom. And in order to do this, they put out these huge ads on all the buses across England that said this, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. And these were on buses just all across the country. Now, I want you to carry out something with me here. This phrase, there's probably no God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. That is the reality of a universe that for many people believe has no creator. That's the sad reality of a universe in which people believe there is no, for lack of better words, intelligent designer or or moral lawgiver. Some of the things we've been talking about throughout this series. But I want to tell you something. The truth is you can live as though this life's meaning is all that we can know, all that we can see and all that we can touch and all that we can hold on to. But where's the source for that meaning? If there's not more to life than this, where do you find a source for meaning? Where do you find a true purpose? And that's exactly what Solomon is writing about in the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you're familiar with who Solomon was, Solomon was considered to be one of the wisest men in the world. But it was wisdom that didn't come from study. It was wisdom that didn't come from experience. It was wisdom that didn't come from just like an accumulation of knowledge for all the years that he spent living. No, God one time asked Solomon, Solomon, what is it that you want me to do for you? You're going to be the new king. What do you want me to do for you? And in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 7 through 14, Solomon just straight out tells God, he's like, God, I'm going to be the king of this land with all of these people in place of my father, David. And I don't understand what to do with them. So Solomon just tells him, so give your servant, talking about himself, a discerning heart. Give me a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And you know, God was pleased with what Solomon said. God was so pleased with what Solomon said that he actually tells Solomon, uh, you didn't ask for wealth. You didn't ask for a long life. You didn't even ask for the death of your enemy, Solomon. So here's what I'm going to do for you. God tells him, I'm going to do what you've asked. I'll give you a wise and discerning heart so that that there will have never been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. 
But not only did God give him the desire of his heart to be this wise king, God also said, I'm going to throw in wealth. I'm going to throw in long life. I'm going to throw in just this amazing reign that will come from you. And you know, Solomon's wisdom was said in the Bible to be just absolutely just high and far above every other wise person of the world. The, the so-called wise of the world couldn't even compare to him. And we find this in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 through 34, that God gave Solomon Solomon great wisdom and very great insight, a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east, greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wise, wiser than anyone else. And here, this is just like harsh here, but the Bible actually throws in the names of all of these people that will forever be remembered as being what? Not as wise as Solomon. And so they talk about these people, but it says that Solomon's fame and his wise was so great that it spread to all the surrounding nations. And if Wikipedia existed back in the days of Solomon, the next few verses would have been Solomon's Wikipedia entry. It would have been all the list of all these things that he has done. It says that he, written, he had written 3,000 proverbs, 1,005 songs, but not only that, plant life, animal life. He's got all that covered too. Solomon was just a man who could do anything. And it said, from all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of it. You know, one of the most famous examples of Solomon's wisdom was found in 1 Kings chapter 3. And it's a story you've probably heard. It's a story where these two women, and the Bible describes them as prostitutes who were living together. And each of these women had babies. You, you know the story probably. But the one night, the both women fall asleep with both of their children laying beside them, but one woman rolls over on her child in the middle of the night and the child dies. So getting up in the middle of the night, the lady finds that her baby is dead and what does she do? What any sane person would do, right? No, she, she goes and she takes the baby and she switches it out with the other woman's baby who is still living and she places it right beside her. She gets up in the morning and they find out that one was alive and one was dead. Now the one who had her baby taken from her, she quickly realizes this is not my kid. And so they go to Solomon. They go to him and they ask him to make a ruling on it. And what does Solomon say? Bring me a sword. I'm going to cut the baby in half. You can have half. You can have half. Everybody, it's that first win, win, win compromise, right? You know, when, when you're trying to heal wounds between people. But no, the lady whose baby it actually was, what did she say? She said, no, give her the baby. I would rather live without my baby and that baby live. And Solomon being the wise man that he was saw through this whole thing that that was actually that woman's baby. Once again, this is the first true win, win, win compromise in human history, which would lead much later, if you're a fan of The Office, to Michael Scott doing the win, win, win compromise of Oscar wearing Angela's baby poster on a t-shirt. You know, it's, it's just, it's just one of those things that has stuck with us throughout life. But, um, Ecclesiastes, as a book, it's Solomon's attempt to find meaning in life. It's Solomon's attempt to find purpose in this life. The things that he seeks out to find it in, and his words were what? He says it's all things that are under the sun. What does he mean by that? Things of this life. Things of this earth. He goes about trying to find meaning and purpose really apart from what God has to say about it. And his conclusion we read early on in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2 says it's meaningless. It's meaningless. It is utterly meaningless to try to find purpose and meaning in this life apart from God. He had looked for it in riches. He had looked for it in power. He had looked for it in wisdom. He had looked for it in relationships. He had looked for it in so many things. You name it, he did it. But he saw that none of it brought meaning. What Solomon eventually finds out is that even though these things can temporarily distract us, they can't satisfy. Even though these things can temporarily keep our minds off a search for greater meaning, they don't bring true and lasting meaning. Solomon said it in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. He said, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone. But what is wisdom? It brings sorrow. What does more knowledge bring? He said, grief. In Ecclesiastes chapter chapter 2. He talks about all the stuff that he has built, all of the things that he has done through his work and through his wealth. And he says at the end of that in verse 11 in chapter 2, he says, I have toiled to achieve all of this stuff, but everything is meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And Paul picks up on this in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is just an amazing passage that Paul writes about the truth and the hope of the resurrection, he says this. He says, if I have fought wild beasts in Ephesus, 
whatever he's talking about there. He said, if I have fought these wild beasts with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? He says, if the dead are not raised, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. What's Paul saying? If human hope is all we have to go on. If the dead are not raised, meaning if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a true historical fact, what is there to this life? What is there to this life? We can just do whatever and it doesn't matter. See, Paul's hopes were built on something greater. Has there ever been a point in your life where you've asked a question of purpose like that? What's the point of this life? Why am I here? What, what, what does all this matter? I know some of you have because I saw them on the index cards that came in those first couple weeks of the series. Some of those questions that if we could ask God one thing, what would we ask? I saw questions of purpose. I saw questions of why am I here? What's this all about? And maybe you won't admit to that in your mind this morning, but I know we have all probably asked these questions, these big questions of life. And what are those big questions? Where did I come from? What's that question of? Origin. Where am I from? Where am I from or why? Who am I? What's that a question of? It's a question of identity. But that question, why am I here? What does it all matter? What does it all mean? That's a question of purpose. And we each need to know how to answer that for our lives. And we've been seeking to answer some of these questions in this series. Some of the big questions of life. And one of the reasons I believe that we seek the answers to questions in this life is because we have been created uniquely to have this thing within us that pushes to know more. This thing within us that wants to know purpose, that wants to know our origin, that wants to know our identity. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon writes about this. He says, I have seen the burden that God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And I'm just going to stop here in verse 11. He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time, but he has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. See, each and every person has been created with this innate desire. We have been gifted this thing from God to want to understand how we fit into the plan of life. It's just really true. We all want to know how, how does any of this work and how do I fit into it? But the thing is, God has instilled this within us. And that's where the problem comes because we can only find the answer to those questions of purpose when we go where? When we go to God. When we seek God for the answers to those questions. But too often, we try to find the answers in so many different places. We try to find the answers on our own and we seek out all of these answers from all of these places. You know, when you're in high school, I remember back when I was in high school, I didn't know much from one day to the next what was going on. Chase, don't chime in. Um, I didn't know much what was going on from one day to the next. But when you're in high school, so often, what do you think? If I can only get into the right school. If I can get into the right program, if I can go to the right place, then everything will fall into place. But then what happens when you're there? There's got to be more to life than this school. What about when you're in college? <sighs> college. Don't even get me started on college. Madden College was a little less new what was going on than Madden High School. <laughs> Don't start Cassie. I know you know people that went to college with me. But what is it when you're in college? If I can get into the right track, if I can find the right major, if I can get around the right people, if I can be put on the right track for the right job, then everything will work out. But then what happens when you get the job, when you get the career, when maybe you get everything you ever wanted, but it turns out this doesn't fulfill me. This isn't what I thought it would be. There's got to be more to life than what? This job. Or we look for it in relationships or we look for it in hobbies, or we look for it in habits, or we look for purpose, all of these things. And how often have we ever been stuck asking the question, isn't there more to life than this? You ever thought that? Am I the only one this morning? There's got to be more to life than this. There's an English author and a journalist, a guy by the name of Bernard Levin, and he wrote this. He said, countries like ours are full of people who have all the material comforts they desire, together with such non-material blessings as a happy family. And yet, they lead lives of desperation, understanding nothing but the fact that there is a hole inside of them. And however much food and drink they pour into it, however many cars and television sets they stuff it with, however many well-balanced children and loyal friends they parade around the edges of it, it aches. Or maybe not as eloquently, actor and comedian Russell Brand said this. He said, drugs and alcohol are not my problem. 
Reality is my problem. Drugs and alcohol are my solution to do what? To fill up a hole inside of me. You see, human beings are created with an internal desire, the eternal. And it's a transcendent longing for what? For fulfillment. But yet we seek it any way we can find it. And unless we're seeking it through God, we're seeking it in the wrong places. You know, sometimes so often we'll just latch on to anything that gives that temporary relief from that feeling of longing. If I only had more money, if I only had nicer clothes, if I only had a better job, if I only got better grades, if I only knew the right people, if I only had the perfect job, life would be mine for the taking. You see, the weird thing is in this life, no matter how much we accumulate, no matter how much we achieve, no matter how much we strive to get more, so often we're still left wanting what? Just that. We're left wanting more. The constant, just perpetual, just cycle of wanting more leaves us wanting more over and over. And as good as material things can be, and we have been blessed in this life with good things. We have. Many of us have been blessed with good things in this life. But what? The more we have, the more we want. And there's a dissonance within us because we have been created for more. We've been created to know more, to find true purpose and meaning in this life. If you really want to get right down to it, we've been created with a spiritual hunger. It's a spiritual hunger that we can only fulfill how? Spiritually. You want to know the truth? You want to know something great this morning? That may be a problem, but the truth is Jesus came to fulfill that hunger. Jesus is the answer to that spiritual hunger. And there's a story in John chapter 6 that that John, one of Jesus' disciples, tells. And if you read John chapter 6, it starts with this huge crowd of people. It says there's 5,000 people. But that's just counting men. I mean, if you count women and children who are inevitably along with all those men, making sure that they got where they needed to be (laughs) and then left at a decent time, you know, so they didn't stand around and talk. Um, But there's probably like maybe 20 or 30,000 people that are there. And Jesus feeds them all miraculously. And what do the people do? They want to come and they want to make him king because he has fed their physical hunger. Jesus, you're a pretty cool miracle working guy. Let's go make you king. And if we have to do it by force, we'll do it. What does Jesus do? Jesus draws away to a mountainside to pray. He, he wants nothing to do with that. So they come and they find Jesus the next day after Jesus walks on water in the middle of a storm. It says that the disciples are, are, are straining going across this water. This is one of those, what, Gilligan's Island, what does it say? If not for the courage of the fearless crew, then the minnow would be lost. It was one of those moments. But Jesus comes walking out on the water to them and they're scared. He says, don't be afraid. And he hops in the boat and they go to the other side and the people come find him. And they come find Jesus and once again they want to make him king. Why is that? It's because their bellies were filled. I am a true bread eater. I've told you this before, bread and meat, that, that's, my, that's my thing. Bread and meat, forget the salad, bring me more bread, please. <laughs> but they wanted their spiritual, they wanted, or they wanted their physical bellies filled because Jesus had given them bread. Probably gave them a little bit of that Texas Roadhouse rolls or the Cheddar Bay biscuits or the Malone's bread with the butter. That's just, that's just me. I don't know what it is for you. Or maybe it's my iron skillet where I make that cornbread. That. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But they want that. And it was actually in their minds that when the Messiah would come, he would reinstitute what Moses did for the Israelites in the wilderness. They, they thought that manna was going to come back. And if you're familiar with that story, when they got up in the mornings, God would send this bread and it would just come on the ground. And they called it manna because that meant, what is it? And they thought that was going to happen again. And so they come to Jesus. And in John chapter 6, Jesus They approach him, and we're going to pick up in verse 30. They ask him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? They saw miraculous feedings from what? Fish and loaves, just a handful. Thousands upon thousands of people. They they want more, though. What will you do, Jesus? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Still thinking of bellies, still thinking of physical nourishment. And what does Jesus say? I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. And he also throws this in, whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Your hunger, taken care of. Your thirst, satisfied. Jesus, when he's saying that he is the bread of life, he is telling them that that hunger that they had been created to fill with only the things of God, that he was the fulfillment for it. For all spiritual hunger, he would be the nourishment for it. All that stuff you saw before, that might have taken care of you physically, but I am the only one who can do it spiritually. That void they had within, that void they were longing to fill, Jesus was the only one who could do it for them. Do we believe that he is the one who can fill the spiritual void we have within us in this life? Is Jesus where we seek the satisfaction for our souls? You know, one of the most foundational things that Jesus ever said was found in John chapter 14, verse 6. And it's a phrase that many of you know full well, but Jesus said what? He said, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. And then he adds to it, no one comes to the Father except through me. What is Jesus saying when he's saying that? When Jesus is saying that he is the way, he's saying that he's the way to a loving and lasting relationship with God that does what? That fulfills the longings of our hearts and our souls. Jesus is the way into that. Jesus adds to it, he says, I'm the truth. Jesus is the truth, not just some intellectual memorization of facts about God, but Jesus is this experiential knowledge that comes from knowing another person personally. It's a difference of what? Head knowledge versus heart knowledge. We have a lot of friends in this life, do we not? Many of our friends are what? They're Facebook friends. They're they're, they're people we follow on Instagram or people we follow on Twitter. And no matter how much you know about a person through their social media feeds, no matter how much you feed into AI (laughs) through a social media feed, no, 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 I'm I'm venturing into your world here for a little bit. But those social media feeds, we could read everything, right? But we would still not know everything about a person. How do we know about people? We get to know them personally. We get to know him in relationship. And that's what Jesus is saying about this knowledge of God. He is the truth because he is the God in the flesh who shows us what it looks like to have a relationship with a real and lasting God. And Jesus says it's possible to know God like that. We know him. We know the Father. And we can know him personally as we know a friend or we know a family member. And we had better believe that this makes the Christian life extremely relevant for all people. If Jesus is the way into it, if Jesus is the way to live this life, and Jesus is the truth about how this life is supposed to be lived, and the one who shows us what it looks like to be in relationship with God, we better believe that Christianity has a huge impact, not only on who we are, but also on how we are to live this life. And we can only find the answers to the questions, well, why am I here? What does all this mean when we find it from God? Jesus says he's the life meaning he's the only one who can give a full life of meaning, the only one who can give a full life of fulfillment, and he does it without guilt or shame. Guilt or shame that says, I know you've been living your life this way, but now I want you to live it this way. I know you've been seeking your own way. I know you've been turning to your own things and trying to find the answers to your own questions, but now find them in me. And come live for me, no guilt, no shame. You see, that's why Jesus went to the cross for forgiveness, but also to remove our guilt and our shame so that we could live fully for him. Do you believe that's what Jesus wants for your life? A life lived fully? You know, so often we know that, but we don't spend a lot of time seeking it out. I found this, these stats. This is from the, the Alpha group, and we got one of those Why Jesus Alpha books back there if you want to pick these up. But it says by the time we're 70 years old, here's how we normally spend our lives on average. 20 years and three months of sleep. Some of us more than others. <laughs> 10 years and five months watching TV. There's a ball game on, perhaps. And seven years and six months eating and drinking. Five years and nine months in some form of transportation, 18 months waiting in line, and six months at red lights. Provided you don't run them. (laughs) Provided you're not running those red lights, you know. Some of us will spend more time sitting at red lights in this life than we will giving any thought to what purpose there is to this life. Think about that. More time just sitting and waiting than wondering, God, why am I here? 
What do you have to say about my life? How do you want me to live it? Solomon searched the world over and found with, that without God there was no meaning. But God sent Jesus to give this life meaning. God sent Jesus to see this life flourish. And when you and I, when we have this feeling that there's got to be more to life than this, it is absolutely and actually true because there is. And what's that more to life? It's Jesus. It is Jesus. It is his life in exchange for our life. He is the only way to real life. He is the only way that we can find meaning and purpose and an inclusion in God's plan for the redemption of this world. And he chooses you for it. Do you remember getting picked in gym class when you were a kid? Does anybody remember back those days? There were some people who loved it because they knew they were going to be picked first. I, I, I go play basketball occasionally on, on Sunday nights, and, and, and Trevor and I used to go do that. And sometimes they would make me pick teams or help pick teams. I'm, I'm, I'm not from Mount Sterling. I don't know these people, but they would have me pick teams. You know what I do when I pick teams? I pick the first person, and I turn it over to them. <laughs> and, I, and I say, you do it. But there are some people that just love being picked. But then there are those others, right? And the words of a great philosopher, those who are last to be picked and in some cases never picked at all. That's a great philosopher. You, you, get, you get that phrase up there that they can see? I'm sure you got it up there. But if, if you're not familiar with the concept of picking teams, you know how it goes. You, 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 this way, this way, this way. We pick the biggest, we pick the brightest, we pick the best. But when you're left standing, when you're one of those who are getting down to the end, what are you thinking? Am I going to be picked? What's the point of all this? Why, why am I even here? Why am I even here? And these are the questions sometimes that we're asking about life. And these questions sometimes creep into all of our life and, and they lead us to all of these places where it filters into our relationships and our, and our careers. And the sad news is they can affect the way we see God. Why would God choose me? But we've been talking about some of the f words of, of Peter in this series. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter writes this. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. When you question whether or not there is meaning or purpose in this life, know this. God is not stuck with you. God chooses you. God's not stuck with you. God chooses you. Don't ever think that you have been disqualified from being a part of God's plan. Maybe in school one day, you made 10 turnovers, threw the ball to the other team every single time, maybe scored five baskets for the other team. You were so bad at this sport that they asked you to sit recess out for the next three days. I don't know what it was. But with God, we are never too far gone. We are never too far broken. We are never too fill in the blank to be chosen by him. God chooses us, but not only that, do you know what God does? God pursues us to be a part of his team, to know our purpose in this life. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he revealed what that purpose was. What's that purpose? We are called out of darkness so that we can sing the praises of God to other people. And if you ever have wondered what the purpose of your life is or what the meaning of your life is, there's a general purpose that all people have, and that's it declares God's goodness. Your general purpose in this life is to declare God's goodness to other people. We get to show other people Jesus by the way we live our lives. And maybe we're wondering, well, where do we do that? Every place you can. Every place you can, you can declare the goodness of God. Each day, wherever we are at any given moment, we get to show others the goodness of God through words, through attitudes, and through actions. The places where you live, your homes, your neighborhoods, what do you get to do there? Show the love of Jesus. Your workplace, your school, sitting at a red light. <laughs> what do you get to do? You get to show people there the love of Jesus. The people you disagree with, the people you have nothing in common with, the people you would rather argue with, what do you get to do for these people? Show them the love of Jesus. We do it through the way we treat them. We do it through the way we listen to them. We do it through the way we care for others. We serve, even and especially when we get nothing in return. And I think sometimes this is where I've been stuck before, and I know we get stuck in this place in our lives when we're seeking God's purpose. We're waiting for something huge to just drop out of the sky. This is yours. Or we're waiting for something super and ultra-specific. 
The thing in this life that we get down to and we're like, you know what? This is the more to life than this. This is what God has called me to. And, and Paul didn't talk about how specific God's will is, but he said in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17, he says, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. There was an author and pastor, a guy by the name of Elmer, Elmer Towns, and he, he's written, written a ton of books. He's actually one of the co-founders of, of Liberty University, but he talked about how trying to figure out God's will for his life was like a point of crisis in his first year in college. He said he was at a chapel service at his college, and the speaker was talking about just doing things that you don't want to do. He says, if there's something in your life that you don't want to do, then that's probably God's will for you. That's what the speaker said. He said, it, it, maybe, maybe God wants you to go to Africa as a missionary, but you're thinking in your head, I don't want to do that. He says, maybe that's what God wants you to do. So Towns was saying that he was sitting there and he was thinking, you know what, that, man, they, they might, that might not be so bad. So that's probably not God's will for my life. Then he gets down to the point to where the, the, the guy is still talking about all of this stuff. And all of a sudden, Towns said he is distracted by this girl who is sitting in his row and she's messing with candy in her purse and she's making this very loud noise. And he thought in his head, I want nothing to do with this girl. I would never marry anyone like that. And he said at that time, the guy from the front said, the one thing you're thinking about right now that you don't want to do, that's probably God's will for your life. So he said he spent the next two weeks thinking, I have to marry this girl. <laughs> I want nothing to do with this girl. And, and so he's struggling with this crisis. And he says another missionary shows up to speak to the chapel. And this missionary says this, she told her life story of always wanting to go to the mission field, always wanting to go to South America, always wanting to minister among the tribes of people who had never heard the name of Jesus. And she said, the thing you want to do more than anything else in this life is God's will for you. And he thought that was such a relief <laughs> because it meant he didn't have to marry this girl, number one, but he said he discovered that day that when we are yielded and surrendered to God, then the things that we want to do will be what, what God wants us to do. But if we are not yielded and surrendered to God, then maybe the things that we don't want to do, maybe something God might be leading us towards. I ask you these questions this morning. Do you know why you're here? And I don't mean in this room, but do you know why you're here on this earth? Do you know what life is all about? Specifically your life. Well, I urge you to surrender to God and see what he can do. See what only he can do. When it comes to finding our specific callings for life, I want to just give you this piece of advice. Ask God to show you parts of it. He might not dump the whole thing on you at once, but ask God to show you parts of it and then pursue it. Step out and trust, in, trust Jesus. Step out and trust him and see where he will lead you. Whatever it is, ask God to show it to you and then trust him to step out and see it. Wherever maybe your talents Maybe your passions, maybe your, your desire for things in this world that you want to line up with the will of God and the things that he has gifted you with. Find out where those things overlap and then seek it wholeheartedly. I don't know if you've ever spent time like wrestling with, with spiritual gifts or even thinking that you, if you are a believer, you've been gifted by the Holy Spirit with gifts to minister to other people. We have a link in our, in our notes. If you follow it, there's a document in there. It's not by any means, 100%, but there's a passions and gifts profile in there. If you've never taken one of those, check it out sometime and, and talk with us. We'd love to talk with you about, about how you can be exercising your gifting for God. You know, all of us are called to specific things, but we've each been given an over call, overall call to love and to serve God by pointing others to his goodness and pointing others to Jesus. Trevor, if you guys want to go ahead and come back up, I'm just going to wrap up here. You know, more than just being good at our jobs, more than just being good members of society, we have been called to point people to Jesus. Jesus, the one who came to this earth, took our place on the cross for the sins we've committed, who is pursuing us even now. Jesus, the one who wants us to know that we are chosen. Jesus, the one who has made us God's special prized possession by purchase, purchasing us with his blood. He wants us to know that we have been chosen and called and that life has meaning, satisfaction, and purpose, and we find it where? In Him. We find it in Him. And maybe this morning you've never even thought about how all the pieces of your life fall into place in finding your purpose. Maybe this morning you know what God is leading you to do, but you've not had the strength to step out and do it. 
I invite you to pray with us this morning. But, but also I invite you to stand and we're going to sing. But before we do that, I'm going to, I'm going to pray over you as you, all, as you all stand. God, we just thank you for each person in this room this morning. We thank you for your word to us. And we thank you, God, that you have a special calling on each one of our lives. But we also thank you, Jesus, that you have showed us and you have taught us the things that are most important when we live. Jesus, when you were asked what the greatest commandment was, you said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then you added to love your neighbor as yourself. You also, before you ascended back into heaven, you told your disciples to, to make disciples, to be your witnesses. And that call is still there for us today. And if we are wrestling with our purpose and, and finding meaning in this life, maybe we just need to focus on those those awesome yet basic things, loving you, loving others, and then making disciples. God, if we would follow that will for our lives, how much greater would this life be? How much greater would our churches be? How much greater would our communities, would our schools, would this world be if we all loved you wholeheartedly, loved our neighbors, and made disciples? Jesus, I pray in these moments that you would speak to our hearts. You would help us to respond as you would lead us to respond and that we would leave this place knowing that you have a special call upon us to be your people in this world and to show others your goodness, your mercy, and your love. We thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.